Welcome. Uh, my name is Eric Maynard. I'm the Director of Education and a Senior Consultant at Jenny Key and Johansson. And I wanted to take this opportunity to talk with you about Flow Properties test results and specifically how do we use those data. Our test report, reports are quite comprehensive. There's a lot of information in there, a lot of symbols and references. So I want to focus on two of the most common areas to help you diagnose and evaluate flow issues that may be occurring with your powders or bulk solids whether it be a granular material, such as the sulfur, it may be a fine powder like this powdered limestone, or it may be a carbonaceous material like a coal, something on that order. So when we're looking at the Jenicky and Johansson test report, as I said, there is a lot of information in there, and probably one of the key things to look at first for your bulk material is that of what kind of flow pattern can I expect with my powder or bulk solid. And for that, we have to evaluate something called wall friction. Now, wall friction is essentially giving me the coefficient of sliding friction between a bulk material, say this pelletized sulfur, and a wall surface. Perhaps it is a mild carbon steel, or maybe a stainless steel with a certain polish or finish to it. It may be even a plastic liner that maximizes sliding of that material against a surface. So with those surfaces, we would look at, can we achieve flow of those materials against the wall of a hopper? We call that type of flow pattern mass flow, where the bulk material is actually sliding against the surface of the hopper, giving us a first in, first out flow. Contrast that to something called funnel flow, where material prefers to funnel first through itself, rather than flowing along the walls of the hopper. So when we look at wall friction data, this is going to be able to tell us for a hopper, and we're often looking at cones, and there are other geometries as well. But today we're just going to focus on cones, and it's going to tell us the angle of the hopper needed to impart flow against the walls. That angle referenced in the test report in the wall friction section is something called theta c. It's referenced from the vertical, and it tells me the maximum hopper angle with a surface to achieve flow against the walls or mass flow. So I would be able to go into the test report. I would look up for a conical hopper with a certain size outlet. What would be that critical angle needed to achieve flow along the walls, again called theta C. And that would give me mass flow. If that angle doesn't meet the requirement, then I would have funnel flow, meaning there'd be no flow along the hopper walls. So that's one of the first things we can do is looking at achieving flow against the walls in mass flow by using the wall friction data. In the test report, we also have angle solutions for hoppers that are not cones. We have them for wedge-shaped hoppers, where the hopper is essentially formed by two flat walls and in those angle solutions, we find that we can achieve mass flow that much easier than doing it in a conical shaped geometry. The second thing I'd like to talk about is that of arching or bridging. Arching or bridging are no flow issues where a material has formed a stable arch or bridge at the outlet of the hopper. Again, in this case, we're going to focus on cones, conical hoppers. And the data that we refer to in the test report is that of cohesive strength. A material having very small amounts of cohesive strength would be this material here, the sulfur granules or pellets. This is very insensitive to pressure. It's fairly free-flowing, and we would not have a cohesive arching problem. Contrast that to this powdered limestone. This material here is sensitive to pressure, and if enough pressure is applied, if there's enough moisture to it, the material can be cohesive enough to form a stable arch or bridge over the outlet of the hopper. So in that case there, when we go to the test report, we look under the section for cohesive strength. You'll see some data as follows. That will say BC. That is the minimum dimension needed to prevent an arch or a bridge in a mass flow hopper. So even if we were to get flow along the walls of mass flow, 
we have to make sure the outlet is sufficiently large enough to prevent that bridge so we can get flow out of the hopper. So you would see a solution for BC. B stands for the span, C stands for the cone shape, and that would tell us that critical dimension needed. It's a minimum value. So if you look in the test report and it says that you need to have 0.5 meters, which is about 20 inches diameter, that is the critical dimension you need. If you make the hopper any smaller for an outlet size, then you're going to run into a bridging problem. If you make it larger than that value, then you're meeting that minimum requirement from a bridging perspective. In some cases, especially when it comes to fine powders, where air interacts with them, you have to make this perhaps even larger, even though you overcome that critical dimension for a bridge, because you need to overcome flow rate restrictions that we normally do not have with coarse materials. So now I've defined for mass flow two key parameters on a cone. The angle of the hopper and the surface needed, whether it's stainless steel or carbon steel. I've also looked at that critical outlet dimension needed to prevent a bridge. The next thing we want to talk about related back to flow pattern is that of a funnel flow condition. Funnel flow is where we have some of the material moving, some of the material stagnant. And in the case of funnel flow, we can go back to the wall friction data, and it will tell us how large of an outlet do I have to have on a cone to overcome something called rack holding. That's down here. This dimension, we call it DF, is the minimum diameter to avoid a stable rack hole from forming in a bin or a hopper or a silo. If I make this outlet of a funnel flow hopper any smaller than this value, df, then a stable rat hole is going to form as shown in this graphic here, and the only active material is going to be in the center of the hopper and everything else remains stagnant. If that's a fine powder, it's going to cake. If it's a segregation issue, it's going to affect mix quality. Uh, certainly caking can be paramount occurring in a funnel flow bin with rat holing problems. So we need to make this dimension at least as large as DF, that diameter, to overcome a stable rat hole in a funnel flow bin. And we get those data in the cohesive strength section, but we can also look at the wall friction data to tell us if we have mass flow or funnel flow. So those are the critical features that we see on mass flow and funnel flow bins. I hope you find this information helpful. If you have any questions on how to utilize these data, how to apply them to an ap actual application, please do not hesitate to contact any of our engineers at Jenneke and Johansson for help in that application. In addition, we have our flow visualization models for these small hoppers that show funnel flow behavior as well as mass flow behavior. Check the URL in this video for a link to obtain one of these little demonstration models as well. Thanks a lot for your time. I hope you found this information helpful. Thank you.